Um, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers and uh, thank you to both Yuri and Maria for really setting up what we're going to talk about this morning. And Maria finished by saying, how do we translate all of this into clinical practice? And I wish I could tell you as a clinician, you didn't have to understand all this molecular stuff, but we do. Um, but the good news is it makes complete sense with what we're seeing in the clinic. Um, if you're in clinic with us these days with the thyroid team at Memorial, we're talking about RAS-like tumors and we're talking about BRAF-like tumors. And if we get an outside consult for a three centimeter tall cell variant of papillary cancer with no lymph nodes, metastasis, we go, now, does that make sense? That's probably a BRAF V600E tumor and they usually have lymph nodes, as Yuri told us. Let's go back and take a look. Or a, a follicular thyroid cancer that um, has NRAS plus TERT. And nobody's looked in the lungs or those places. So we are beginning to utilize a lot of this information in our risk stratification. Um, and it's amazing to think about how far we've come since, I think it was probably the mid 1990s when Dr. Nikki Farf was explaining to me about RET PTC in uh, some of the Chernobyl cases that he was taking care of in the, in the Fagan lab and examining to see now this incredible next generation sequencing and how all this molecular sort of characterization of the tumors matches so nicely with our clinical experience. And that's what we're gonna try to integrate today. Now, if I look back at where I started, uh, I did my fellowship in 1990, last century. Um, but at that time, risk stratification was really post-operative. Um, and it really was a very basic path report um, it was really easy. The PATH report was about two sentences. We didn't have all these details in it. It said papillary or medullary or anaplasty. Uh, we were interested if there was gross invasion and distant metastasis, and that was pretty much the staging system. Confined to the thyroid, locally invasive or distant metastasis. Um, it really was designed to predict disease-specific mortality, but as you've heard the last couple days, very few people die of thyroid cancer compared to everybody that has thyroid cancer. So most of the time I didn't need that. We weren't worried about death. It was recurrence or persistent. Had little impact on sort of our therapeutic decision-making because at that time we were still under the paradigm that almost everybody got a total thyroidectomy. Almost everybody got radioactive iodine. We put the TSH to zero and then we watched the patients for 50 years because we didn't know who was gonna do well and who was gonna do poorly. Well, clearly our vision and our understanding of risk stratification in thyroid cancer has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. A lot of people have been working on this and I'll show you now, rather than risk stratification beginning after surgery, in our view, it begins as soon as you see a suspicious nodule, not even after the, after the biopsy, as soon as you find something suspicious. And we've referred to this as peridiagnostic risk assessment around the time of diagnosis. Now, I stole that from our lung cancer colleagues because the lung doctors often find small nodules in the lung and they have to decide which ones do they biopsy, which ones do they watch, what's the risk of those nodules. And they had referred to that as peridiagnostic. And then we put our words on it as usual and said, look, in this early stage, in this early evaluation, we're really trying to figure out, is somebody at a good candidate for a minimalistic management? Now that minimalistic management might be just watching, it might be a biopsy and then watch, it might be just lobectomy, but trying to make that decision before we even decide to make a diagnosis and decide which one of those patients would be ideal, appropriate or inappropriate for sort of those minimalistic management approaches. Well, we certainly do risk stratification after the surgery if we go down that pathway and use the eighth edition, as I'll show you, to predict risk of uh, death from thyroid cancer, the ATA to predict risk of recurrence. And then we'll touch on just a little bit at the end to bring it full circle, how we evaluate what happens over time. Because even if we get to the six week point past surgery, um, you've only negotiated the first few months in the life of a thyroid cancer patient and most of these are going to live a long time. They're going to outlive their endocrinologist and their primary care doctor. So how do we adjust plans as they develop downstream? Now, the challenge that uh, the team gave me this morning is to look at what has been called 
perioperative risk stratification. And this came out of one of the second or third Martinique meetings where we were really focused honestly on trying to decide you know, who could benefit from radioactive iodine, either ablation or adjuvant therapy or treatment of known disease. For me, I was also trying to figure out what additional staging information should I request based on what the pathology report and the interoperative report was. And, you know, not only making adjuvant therapy decision makings, but questions like, you did a lobectomy, do you need a completion thyroidectomy? What should that early TSH be? Do we need a radioactive iodine scan for scanning? All of that happens in those first few weeks after the surgery. Um, these are important things because these are the decisions that we have to make early on, right up front with the patient, um, that sort of guides what's going to happen throughout their time. So I really sort of divided this up into sort of three things that we would think about. The preoperative evaluations, the interoperative evaluations, and then the early postoperative testing. Now, I think many times as endocrinologists, we'll see a patient after surgery. Um, when you're in an academic center like us, many times we don't even see them before surgery. And sometimes you forget to look at all of those preoperative evaluations. You're looking at a PATH report and you say, well, it's kind of nice to see the PATH report, but how do we begin to sort of really integrate all three of these different areas into a single sort of prediction disease recurrence pattern? Now, in this preoperative stuff, we have to consider not only just the PATH report afterwards, but what was that history? What was that physical exam? What was the natural history of this nodule? Was it growing rapidly? Was it growing slowly? Did they have invasion into a recurrent laryngeal nerve? Do they have vocal cord paralysis? Um, one of my things that I always do when I see these patients for the first time after surgery is I go through all of their outside records because you'd be surprised the number of times there's some small nodules in the lungs that was sort of forgotten about or wasn't part of the pre-surgical training, but was done at a different hospital that nobody knew about. Or somebody had had a CT scan of the neck um, six months before surgery, unknown to the surgeon. The ultrasound didn't find anything, but on that old CT scan was a high retropharyngeal node or a lateral neck node. There, that, some staging information that if we would have known that could have changed what we did. Obviously, understanding the cytology and the molecular findings. In the United States now, it's not uncommon for us to know some of the molecular characteristics of a nodule that's been evaluated. So while we don't routinely do molecular testing on every nodule that comes down the pike, if they have that information, we're going to integrate that information into RAS or RET-PTC or BRAF. And does that match what I'm seeing on the pathology report? And does the extent of disease match what I would have expected from that molecular characteristic with that size tumor. All of that, again, sort of helping us understand those risk stratification. And then, as I mentioned, really carefully looking at pre-op imaging findings. Um, these days, at, at least in New York and at Memorial, uh, patients get the results of their ultrasounds and their CT scans about the same minute that I do on the patient portal. They come up and they're there. Um, and I, I've seen several patients over the years that came to me because they had a recurrence at six months um, and mom is holding the teenager's ultrasound that says this recurrence was a lymph node over here. It was on the ultrasound before the first surgery and I asked about it. We didn't do anything about it. We thought it was kind of small. So they're also helping us do risk stratification and very carefully reading through these reports. So again, being careful in the preoperative evaluation that we know the extent of disease and we tailor that operation so that we can make sure we've taken care of all the disease that we know about right up front. The second piece is the interoperative findings. And many years ago with Sally Carty, the ATA wrote a paper, I can't believe it's been 10 years ago now, that talked about how important it was for the endocrinologist to understand the interoperative findings, how important it was for the nuclear medicine doctors to understand the interoperative findings. And I'll show you in a minute when we get to the AJCC staging system, you can't accurately stage a patient without understanding what went on in the operating room. Um, and so these findings inside the operating room have to be communicated to us. Um, what was, how much thyroid tissue was taken out? 
how much lymph node surgery was taken out. And yeah, when they say they did a total thyroidectomy, how much of a total thyroidectomy happened? Because, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a surgeon. I just sort of listen to them talk and hang out in the ORs. But if you do an operation on one side and there's a little, you know, damage to the nerve, it's still working, but we're okay. When you go to that other side, you may not take out as much. You're going to get most of it. But I need to know when I do my radioactive iodine scanning, has that been something that was factored into what you did? How did you sort of go between 98 versus 99% of a total thyroidectomy? Those are information that we need. When you did a lymph node resection, what does that mean? What areas did you clean out? What areas did you leave behind? Um, really critical that we understand gross extrathyroid extension. Not only the presence or absence, <clears throat> I'm sorry, not only the presence or absence, but which structures were involved. Because it's important for the endocrinologist to differentiate gross extrathyroid extension, which means at the time of surgery or preoperative or on the imaging or on our functional test, we knew that tumor was growing outside the thyroid and into a major structure or outside the lymph node into a major structure. The surgeon sees that when she's operating. She can see where that disease is, and that requires a little more surgery. Um, I want to know where that gross extrathyroid extension was, because honestly, if it's anterior to the thyroid and it's into those strap muscles in front of the neck, I, I don't worry about that so much in terms of residual disease, because the surgeon will take out the thyroid and they'll take out the involved structure. That, that involved muscle will come out, no big deal. On the other hand, if that gross extrathyroid extension is toward the recurrent laryngeal nerve or toward the trachea or toward major vessels, and they're scraping disease off. It's hard to get a complete total resection without taking the windpipe and the vessels and that thing. So uh, I tell patients, it's a little like trying to take out mortar between bricks. That Yeah, you're going to get out everything that you can see, but there's probably some little microscopic stuff remaining. That's important for me to know because it may just be a two centimeter papillary or a two centimeter tall cell variant of papillary. I'm not too excited about two centimeters, but if I know you spent time scraping it off a nerve or scraping it off the trachea, that takes it to a different level to me. And that helps us understand what's going on. It's really important to me that I understand the completeness of the resection. Uh, in the past, before I think our operative notes had gotten a little bit better, I would usually pull the surgeon over to the side and go, all right, tell me the truth. Uh, did you get it all? What did you leave? How much was you have left? Um, because that's an important component. Now, one of the other important components, uh, and this is primarily for the surgeons and whoever dictates those op reports, you have to remember that most endocrinologists cannot interpret your operative reports. Um, the, if you just dictate the usual, you know, one paragraph, four page thing that says what you did in the operating room, we'll have a hard time understanding that. Um, we've helped endocrinologists understand the levels of lymph node metastasis, two, three, four, five, six. So we, we do that for the ultrasound. But if your op report says it was a paratracheal lymph node, we don't know what that means. Um, in fact, when we had, uh, we did a study with Dr. Baxi, where we had my fellows who've done a lot of thyroid cancer read through the operative note, and they couldn't even really tell when you said you resected the left lobe off the trachea, they didn't know whether that meant that was invaded or whether it just rolled off. Um, a lot of those language that's implicit, if you know how the operation works and you know how you guys normally use the language is easy. But remember, this is a different language for us. Um, and so if I had my way, my personal preference would be right at the very top of your operative report, right before you write that long section that says, dear, your honor, here's what I did. Um, a paragraph right there at the top that says, here's what I found. I took this out. It was invading this. This was this is an area to worry about. Just in, in three or four little short sentences where the endocrinologist can understand anytime they look at that report, exactly what you did, exactly what you found, especially if there's gross extrathyroid extension, if there's any uh, concern about completeness of resection, if you've had to do a little less than the total thyroidectomy for good reasons, um, let us know that there's some normal tissue left in that contralateral berry ligament or at the superior pole. Those things help us interpret our post-op ultrasounds and our radioactive iodine. Now, the post-operative findings also certainly count here. 
Because when we wrote the AJCC, the eighth edition, we had to set some time frame, and we knew we wanted people to be able to use information that happened more than from the time the doors opened in the recovery room. So we set a four month time frame. It's arbitrary. We made it up. I understand that. But we figured if you had four months after surgery, that would give you time to get a post op thyroid globulin at six weeks and maybe again at three months, as Luca was showing us yesterday. It'd give you time to do the radioactive iodine scanning or post therapy scanning. Or if the six week thyroid globulin came back at 500, it would give you time to go find that disease. So that perioperative finding extends to four months. If you think about that, that's a pretty good time frame. There's some good information that happens in that first four months. You get a very detailed pathology report. And I think these days, most of the pathologists around the country are using these synoptic reports where very, very good pathologists have outlined the important pieces of information that we need to know about. Um, there certainly is some molecular characterization that goes on. Um, we certainly don't do molecular testing on every one of the thyroid cancers that we test out. Um, but as I said, you'll often know it from the nodule. And then there are some that we do right up front that tend to be the more aggressive, the more worrisome ones that we think are going to end up being treated by our oncologist or endocrine oncologist. But all of that, if we have it, is going to be integrated in. The importance of postoperative functional and structural imaging. Now, I know in the United States, we've always talked about really just using thyroid globulin. But as I travel the world, a lot of people use a post-op thyroid globulin. And a lot of people use a post-op ultrasound. An ultrasound, I know in the first couple months after surgery, it's going to be a lot of scar tissue. It's going to be a little hard to tell, but I'm not looking for millimeter lymph nodes. Maybe if the surgery was done by somebody I don't know in the United States or anyplace else, and they're coming to see me for an opinion, I'll often get a post-op thyroid globulin, looking for golf balls, looking for, did they really do a total thyroidectomy? Do I see any great big lymph node metastasis? All of that helps me, not for like the ultimate sensitivity, but at early response, how well did that first surgery go? As Luca talked about yesterday, clearly looking at the post-op thyroid globulin and thyroid globulin antibodies uh, lets you know, you know, are you on the right track? If that post-op thyroid globulin is undetectable or very low and the antibodies are negative and somebody was low risk and there's no worrisome preoperative findings and the surgery looked good, well, that makes it easy. Then, then you're going to follow a little bit more because probably not going to have bad outcomes and you may be able to follow with a more minimalistic management approach. Now, to put this into just sort of a practical standpoint and, and sort of bring together in a staging system what we talked about thus far, when we look at how the eighth edition has been done, you really only need to know three factors to get people in the right box. I can teach you the entire staging system for the vast majority of your patients up here in the left-hand corner. If they're less than 55 years old, unless they have distant metastasis, they're stage one. And if you think about it, that's the vast majority of patients we see in thyroid cancer, even in a specialty clinic like mine. That's why we say the majority of thyroid cancer patients are not risk of dying from their disease. Now, if you're older, distant mets is clearly one of the big keys. And here's what I was talking about, the PATH report. Gross extrathyroid extension, it makes a difference if it's in prevertebral fascia. This is essentially unresectable. This subcutaneous tissue, trachea, this is usually resectable, but probably scraped off with some minimal residual disease. And this can be completely resected. And so what this gross extrathyroid extension reflects is not only the biology of the tumor, but it also reflects the likely effectiveness of the surgery. Yeah, if it's relatively aggressive, but you can totally resect it, you're going to do better. If you can resect down to minimal residual disease, a little worse. And if you leave gross disease behind, it's even worse. So from that op report, we need to know gross extrathyroid extension, yes or no, and what structures were involved. Now, this system has actually turned out to work really well, because I'll be honest with you, I never used the seventh edition or those before. It didn't help me. They had too many people in the high risk. This is from Ashok Shaha in our group. And now if you look in the eighth edition, even in our surgical database, where we have this terrible referral bias like Maria does, we get sent preferentially people that are more aggressive. Even with that, the vast majority of ours are stage one. 
very few stage three and stage four. And this is from Julianne Sosa's group, shows that the eighth edition really does sort out stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four, where the older ones didn't. So I think it is worthwhile to think about the AJC staging system, even if the majority of the time you're only telling the patient that they're stage one, because patients are all over Dr. Google, they totally understand what stage one means. And so I find this reassuring for the majority of patients. And it can also send up red flags for you if somebody is in that stage three or stage four category. Now, as I mentioned before, it, this perioperative risk stratification, we're interested not only in predicting the risk of death, but what's the risk of recurrence? Because when we begin to talk about adjuvant therapy and radioactive iodine and TSH suppression, and in fact, how often to repeat the ultrasounds and imaging, you need to know what the risk is to begin with. And this has been developed really over the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years now with several groups where early on, a lot of us divided this up into sort of three groups, what's low risk, what's intermediate and high risk. And there's no question this system has worked really well. Now, one of the areas that I'm still coming back to, and we talked about it a little bit yesterday, is what's the role of this post-op diagnostic scheme? Um, when we originally wrote this, I put this on here and then I didn't think about it for 15 years. Um, and then I ran into this uh, very kind, gentle, opinionated gentleman named Doug Van Nostrand. And Doug and I have spent a lot of time over the last several years sort of rethinking this and helping me understand these issues of the diagnostic scanning. Uh, this is a table Seiza put together in one of the Martinique papers that really caused us to sort of go back and look. You heard the discussion yesterday, the diagnostic scanning after total thyroidectomy, not a very sensitive test. I get it. You can have small volume disease that you can't see on the diagnostic scan. On the other hand, if you did see something on the diagnostic scan and that upstaged you uh, up to M1 disease, now it's not adjuvant therapy, it's treatment of known disease. That's a different discussion, right? Because we've talked about what's ablation, what's adjuvant therapy, and what's treatment of known disease. Because in an adjuvant therapy discussion, I may say, you're intermediate risk. I think you're a 5% chance of having something go wrong. We can treat that in the future, may or may not need radioactive iodine. But if I tell that same patient, well, that was your risk, but I did a diagnostic scan and I see uptake in lymph nodes, or I see RAI AVID uptake in the lungs. That's going to be a different discussion, right? That's not adjuvant therapy. That's A, you have metastatic disease. More importantly, you've got RAI avid metastatic disease, probably very avid because I can see it on a diagnostic scan. And so I think that would change the way that we would have the discussion. Um, Doug also helped me understand that not all diagnostic scans are created even. Uh, if you're just doing quick planar imaging, it's probably not going to help you very much. It'll help you find the big stuff, but the big stuff you already know about by the thyroglobulin values in those things. So it's caused me to sort of take a step back. Um, the, in, the, in the Martinique paper, I think we hit a very nice middle ground uh, where we, we said it should be a selective use approach in these intermediate risk patients, probably not necessary in the low risk patients, may or may not be necessary in the high risk patients, but in this, in this intermediate risk patients, I'm convinced there's a group of patients this can help us. Help us either treat or not treat, help us maybe change the administered activity, and in fact, in the original guidelines that I helped with Lord 2006 or something, one of the sentences we wrote in there was, you should consider a diagnostic scan if it's gonna change your decision to treat with radioactive iodine or if it's gonna change your administered activity. Um, and that theme has come through. I don't know that I know how to select the proper patients yet and having to integrate what is their risk outcomes, risk of dying, risk of dying, risk of recurrence, What's the likelihood that the tumor is going to be RAI avid? A diagnostic scanning in a, a poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, unlikely to help us, right? Because it's so RAI avid. On the other hand, a diagnostic scan in a RAS driven tumor uh, that's more likely to be RAI avid, maybe we should think about it. Issues like is there an impact of early versus late RAI treatment, the therapy? Um, and, you know, if it doesn't make any difference whether I treat it at one millimeter or two millimeters, well, maybe I just sit back and wait till the thyroglobin comes up. But we all know with radioactive iodine, smaller is better if we can get it. 
Um, and then, as I mentioned before, really optimizing the diagnostic scheme. Um, but I'll tell you, even when we use spec CT, I find differences in interpretation of those little remnants we see at the superior pole where the superior laryngeal nerve comes in and it buries ligament. And at the inferior poles, what some nuclear medicine doctors will call just normal remnants, top of the thyroid, other people will call discrete lymph node metastasis. So we still have some work to do on the optimization. So I guess my plea is that we don't abandon the diagnostic scan right now um, and sort of look at what's the proper patient that would be most likely to benefit based on the risk and the likelihood and how we're doing the imaging. Now, I'll finish with this, that as we sort of thought through expanding these low risk categories, this is one of the things that made me think about the diagnostic scan again, because there's no question in these follicular driven tumors, these are the RAS tumors that, that Yuri talked about, um, that were capsular invasion with a little bit of vascular invasion. But if that was a RAS plus a TERT, then we're gonna go, well, that's at higher risk for distant metastasis. It's unlikely, the risk is low. But if it was there, it could be bad. And I've got a therapy that could potentially work. If radioactive iodine was ever going to work in the adjuvant setting, it's in a RAS-driven follicular-based tumor. So this is a situation where perhaps it's definitely a low-risk tumor, but could rational people make the decision to still do an adjuvant therapy radioactive iodine because it could work so well? And if it works so well, that traditional ablation dose administered activity at 30 millicuries might be reasonable. Now, as Yuri will set the stage here for us, uh, the, it, when we wrote that last set of 2015 guidelines, you have to remember, most of the text was written in 2014. Um, and as Yuri showed you that timeline, a lot about what we know about sort of how we integrate the molecular findings was really just being known. And these were the early things that we put on this. And there was no question that as we walked through the course of the next few years, that these molecular findings would be integrated into these traditional anatomic findings to help us understand how best to sort of really risk stratify. And so if I take us to where we sort of finally finished right now, is I think where we are is we're thinking about risk stratification from right before we find a nodule all the way through the time of the final follow-up. We wanna make sure we understand all of that information about perioperative risk stratification, preoperative, intraoperative, postoperative, and integrate that into our initial staging systems for risk of death, risk of recurrence. I think it also gets integrated into things like likelihood of radioactive iodine avidity. What's the location of the recurrence likely to be? Because that helps you know how to plan the follow-up. And then as patients come back every time, we look at the information that comes through and say, okay, are you an excellent response? Which means, are you in remission? If you're a low risk patient or an intermediate risk patient that had a two or 3% chance of recurrence, and now we're a year down the road and the thyroid globulins are zero and the ultrasound is undetectable, that risk of recurrence now in the low and intermediate is less than 1%. What's the benefit of doing an ultrasound? An ultrasound will have false positive rates of 25, 30%. So well-meaning clinicians will go, well, what's it hurt? I'll do an ultrasound. Uh, I'm gonna do a test that has 25 times more false positive than finding real disease. Um, it makes us really think about how we should do this and what's the off-ramp? How do we get people out of the endocrinology practices and over into following up with their primary care doctors? Um, I'm excited to see the future of risk stratification. I'm not on the ATA guidelines writing committee this year for the first time in many years, which is awesome. Uh, but I trust that the guidelines committee is going to be taking a lot of this molecular findings that Yuri's going to talk about it in the next back and finding out how do we overlay that into, our, into this model of risk stratification to help us decide minimalistic management. Are there some of those tumors based on that molecular characteristic should not be candidates for minimalistic management? But to do that, you gotta show me that more aggressive therapy is gonna make a difference, right? You can't just pick out a bad tumor and then do a lot of extra therapy to it if it's not gonna make any difference. So there's a lot of work that we have to do. But clearly in the risk stratification series, there's no question that we're gonna be able to incorporate some of these molecular findings and characteristics to refine what we're doing here. Thanks very much.